Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, I hoped that I could get all of the fabrication into one video, but it was a little more than would fit into one. And so this is a fabrication number two. We're also going to go over a little bit of the plans on the internal wiring. And I think I talked about painting these. Probably for now, I'm just going to leave them silver, see what it ends up looking like. You can put in the comments what you think of this or whether you think I should paint them or not. I think it might end up looking kind of cool. So I'm going to hold my judgment until I get this all finished up. And let's jump into getting the fabrication on this done. We're going to have two RCA jacks like this over in this corner. And we want to make sure we stay away from this lip here, which you can measure this, and that's the width that this double layer is. So you want to make sure that your RCA jack is at least that far away. And so we want the center, 20 millimeters should be good. So I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of little tentative marks here where these probably going to be going from this edge and then we want to mark the vertical we want to make these the same but we want to have them far enough apart where they can be plugged in without having a problem so I've probably got them fairly fairly well spaced just like they are so Let's see what this one is and just make them exactly the same. That's 15 millimeters. Well, 15 millimeters looks good. So, so we'll go 15 and 15. And there are two marks for the RCA jacks. The other thing I wanted to show you is the difference in a quality and a cheap RCA jack. So here's the difference in the two. These good ones, you're soldering to the actual body of the jack for the ground. And then to the center lug. On these, you can't solder to the body because there's too much mass here. And it ends up melting the plastic that's inside, insulating the thing from the outer and the inner shell. So you have to use these little cheesy solder tabs for the ground that require a mechanical connection and to me that's just not as good as being able to solder directly to the body and these have a a little cheap looking nut that holds them on the nicer one has this nut so it's just a lot nicer looking product and they're not that much more expensive so I highly recommend using these types of RCA jacks and I'm going to show you on the speaker jacks too. Here's the little cheapies that you can buy. And there's two different versions of these. One of them has a, a nut like this. And one of them has a nut like this. Okay, and you look at them and you go, those look identical. Well, watch how this one, when I turn it, See how the inner part stays still? So as you're tightening the nut, this is clamping down on the wire, and then the nut's tightening up against that flat surface. Well, on this one, it's one piece. The whole thing spins, and it just chews up your speaker cable when you're trying to tighten them up. And there is absolutely no way to tell these two apart when you're shopping online for them. And so I don't know what to tell you. I mean, maybe you can kind of see on this one where it's got the little, where the threads come all the way to the end. And on this one, there's a little bit of a step. But I doubt they're going to show you that in the ad. The other thing that I don't like about these is 
they want you to be using this little nut and this little solder tab. And again, you're making a mechanical connection instead of soldering right to it. But I showed you on the little headphone thing, you can solder to the end of this little stud. So as long as you get the ones with the two-piece nut, these work okay. But I much prefer these large speaker jacks like this. All of these that have a two-piece nut, they've got this place here where you're soldering in. And the main thing is you've got a much bigger hole that the speaker wire is going through. And so I use 12 gauge stranded zip cord that I've tinned the ends of the lead so I don't have stray wires. And they just won't fit through these. And on these, they fit easily through. And so, again, you're not spending a whole lot more money. And the only reason I used these on the headphone jack is there just wasn't enough room on that little box to put eight of these. So, the other thing that I want to do with my speaker jacks is I want to keep them down this way, you know, as far as I can. But I also don't want to get them tangled up with these RCA jacks. So, we're probably going to space them something like this and I do have a common spacing for all my amplifiers which is 32 millimeters or one and a quarter inches and so we want to space those like that and then these like that and I want to mark them in the center from the top to the bottom across like this and I'm going to double check my spacing in between, but it is helpful if you have common spacing for all your amplifiers and then your speaker wires, however you've, you know, bent them up so that they fit real neat. It's easy to swap from one amp to another. So I'm going to get these RCA jacks drilled, get these drilled, drill this power thing, and then we're going to come back and do the IEC socket for the power cord, and we are done with all the fabrication. Okay, so what I'm trying this time, in the past I had punched a big circle and then like filed out the corners, and that admittedly was a lot of work. And I know a lot of people do this stuff with a Dremel tool and a cutoff wheel, and if you're comfortable doing that, that's fine. I personally just had those things slip too many times and end up skating across a surface and putting marks on it. So I like doing this by hand. So what I've tried this time is I got a really fine tooth blade for my coping saw and I drilled a quarter inch hole in three of the corners and then I'm using the coping saw to cut out the metal in between it and it's actually going really well. And then once I get done, I'm cutting just inside this line. And then I'm going to come back with a file and dress up these edges until the um, our little socket here will slip inside it. So time to get back to sawing. And then, like I said, I'll come back with a file and square off these edges, and we'll have our socket hole cut out. Yeah, guys, I think I like that way a lot better. Didn't take near as long as I fought with in the past, and I just came back with a file like this and straightened up these edges, touched it up a little bit with this little small file, and it just drops right in. Super nice. So, one of these things I do on these steel chassis is I come back with a Q-tip and a little bit of this uh, tester's model enamel, and I touch up all these edges with a little black paint because eventually it will rust because it's steel, and you don't want to have like rust bubbling up underneath this powder coat or some other weird thing happening. So, it's just a nice way to finish them off. So I am going to put the socket in this direction with the fuse towards the bottom. 
and that puts the two power leads over here in this direction towards this side here and then we got to connect this ground up to a ground lug and I think I'm going to put it right about here. So I'm going to mark this and we're going to put a little 440 screw that's going to be our chassis ground and then we're going to mark these two holes to come back and, and drill our mounting holes where we're going to mount it with a little bolt and a nut. Do not try to use these mounting screws as a like combo ground. You don't want to do that. Because this is plastic, you want a super solid ground. And we're going to scrape the powder coating off the inside when we put the bolt in the K-nut. And I'll show you that when we get around to doing that. The other little trick I do too is, so I, if I ever want to reuse these transformers, I take the labels off of them and glue them on the inside of the chassis with a little bit of contact cement so that I know they're not going to fall off and in the future I can look in here and go, oh, here's what those transformers are. And I won't be guessing at what I used on this project in case I ever decide to repurpose them in the future. So I'm going to finish drilling these holes in the right here all around this power socket, get it bolted down, and we finished up all the fabrication. Okay, now I'm going to do a little wrap up of this video. And here we are with all the fab work done. Got the tube sockets mounted with the little dress up rings. I went ahead and moved the RCA jacks over here on the side for mine. Power switch is back here in the back corner. Obviously, this is DIY. You can do this however you want. If you want to put the RCA jacks in the back like I originally had them, if you want to put them in the front, you can put the power switch in the front. It's all up to you. I do like keeping the power switch back here in this back corner so all the high voltage AC from the line voltage is all right here in this little corner. And then for my use, testing, I like these RCA jacks on the side because there's less likelihood that we're going to have any interference with the output transformers on our test results. We should get really clean signal because it's going to go straight from here over to the tubes. So anyway, I think it looks pretty cool. Like I said, I decided for now not to paint these transformers. In real life, the silver is not as jarring as it may be on camera with all these lights, but you may want to paint them black. This is your project. You can paint them purple, green, whatever you want to do. So anyway, all we got left now is to go into the wiring. Here's another peek at the schematic. As you can see, there's not a lot to connect. It's pretty simple inside. So first thing we're going to do when we start dealing with the wiring, we're going to try to deal with some of the bowl of spaghetti wiring that's inside this thing right now. Give you a little peek. It's like, whoo, man, that's a mess. But Anyway, I don't think it'll take long to get rid of the stuff that we're not using, hook up the AC power that we're going to be using, and I'll also, in this build, I'll show you how I test an amp as I go along. I highly recommend that you never, like, assemble the whole amplifier before you first power it up. That's just asking for problems. And then if there is a problem, You've got it so far assembled, it's like, where is the problem? So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to wire up all the heaters and turn it on and make sure the heaters all work and we've got good heater voltage. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to wire up the rectifier tube with all the filtering capacitors and get that section all wired up. Then we're going to power it up and we're going to check and make sure that our B plus looks reasonable. It's going to be high because there's no load on it, but we can at least see if it looks reasonable. Then once that's done, we wire up the output tubes with the cathode resistors and all that stuff without any input signal to them and check and make sure that we've got the tubes biased right 
and that we're seeing reasonable voltages on the cathodes. And then if it was a integrated amp, at that point we would wire up the driver tubes and then test them last. So that's kind of the sequence on building an amplifier and how it gets powered up several times during the build process to kind of check our progress because if the B plus is messed up, you don't want to wait till you have the whole amp wired up and you power it up and you're like, what the hell's wrong with this thing? So anyway, we'll go through that whole process as we're doing this and hopefully one, maybe two videos, we'll have this thing wired up and be ready to start testing it. So hope you're enjoying the series. If you are, please sub to this channel. Please like the video and we'll see you soon for more EL84 fun. Have a great day.